this on? Yeah, sounds like it. Perfect. Um, so, welcome to the next um, open data talk after me figuring out how the presentation actually works. And it's um, data and the city using big data to make decisions in the urban space, which is just about the longest title I could possibly fit on one slide. Um, so I'm representing Home on Demand, which is a startup in the um, US Now incubator of Immobilien Scout 24 here in Berlin, which is basically a huge um, real estate portal, um, largest in Europe and I think um, after China the world. Um, so it's going to be really about this kind of real estate urban space. Uh, and what I wanted to do is briefly introduce um, myself and what we are working on. Uh, talk about the city as a, as a social network and the way people commonly understand it currently. Um, and then really go into open data. Uh, what is available there, what we're working with, and what, how we can put it to work to really work for, for people. Um, and then of course people are important so to look at the consumer side before hopefully uh, we'll have a, a good discussion. Um, let me just set up my timer actually so I can make sure we do. Well, okay, I think we look more or less complete. Um, so in the spirit of a startup, let's iterate and pivot and once again with more feeling. Uh, most of you have already heard the introduction, uh, but still this talk is about data and the city, um, using big data to make decisions in the urban space. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to make sense of that title in the course of this talk. Um, so I'm representing Home on Demand, which is a startup in the uh, US Now incubator of Immobilienscout24 in Berlin here. Um, Immobilienscout24 is, or 24, if I want to stay in English completely, is um, uh, one of the largest real estate portals um, in the world and um, they are working uh, with lots of data and so are we, so it's a good fit. Um, I wanted to introduce myself and our project um, before talking about, about a bit about um, data in the city and how uh, a city is understood and how it should be understood. Perhaps um, go into open data, uh, what kind of data we are working with, what is actually available. Um, about how to put this data to work for people and how people, in our case consumers, can be empowered using that data. And then hopefully uh, we'll have time for a good discussion. Um, so, a bit about myself. I'm um, the CTO of Home On Demand, uh, but my background is a bit checkered for someone doing that. I have a, a bachelor's in uh, sociology, uh, I have a master's in political communication and now I'm wondering how to keep a database server up and running and how to use instances in the cloud, so that's quite a journey. Uh, and the, you know, the, if you will, the advantage and disadvantage of that is that I can talk about a lot of things, but I, I'm also wrong about a lot of things, so in the spirit of open data, um, you know, part of the discussion is, uh, you know, if you have an idea, if you have something, uh, make sure to tell me where I'm wrong. Um, now, Home on Demand is um, a London-based startup and a London-focused startup, and we do recommendations for properties in urban markets. So we try to find you something that really suits what you need, uh, and for that we make sense of uh, the market using open data. Um, and what we try to do is not only, you know, bring up this data in a sense that you don't understand, but you guide you through the process. Now, uh, you can check out the site if you happen to look for a flat in London, uh, but you should um, keep in mind it's basically currently a technology platform, so don't expect everything to work um, correctly. Um, exactly like this talk. Um, so, I wanted to talk a bit about um, the city because we think it's an extremely interesting um, thing to deal with um, and most everyone who, uh, who lives in a city for quite a while uh, will believe that they understand that city. If they look for a place they think they know what they are doing 
uh, but in many cases they uh, use simple heuristics to get along and make their decisions. Um, and that's something my co-founder realized when he, uh, in, a, in a bad way actually, when he forced himself to move um, this summer to test some of our concepts. So he went to a real estate agent and he had this kind of neighborhood in mind that he liked and the real estate agent uh, said to him, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of a nice neighborhood, but there are not, uh, you know, many British people there. And by British people, she of course meant white people. So she already used a fairly dangerous heuristic where she um, conveyed the sense that if you have a lot of uh, people with an immigration background in a certain part of the city, that's a negative thing. Um, now, if we look at uh, what the distribution is actually like here, um, that's uh, white British people in London. Um, if you wanted to live in a neighborhood that is entirely British, uh, entirely white, you would live in the outskirts where most people actually don't want to live um, for, for various reasons. Um, and there's a sense um, that, you know, what she also said is that you should avoid East London because there are uh, many non-British people by which she meant uh, Pakistanis. Um, and this again is a heuristic that doesn't work uh, on a moral level, but also she doesn't know that. So there are clusters of communities in London uh, that people are not aware of and they make very uh, general uh, statements um, that can be quite dangerous, um, simply because of a lack of understanding. Uh, if we look at what she really was getting up at, that there are neighborhoods that are uh, more affluent and less affluent, um, you can see that that has nothing to do with these kind of communities, even though most people I talk to uh, believe that. So East London is indeed a more problematic area, but there are problematic areas across London and people concentrate this kind of sense in the heuristics saying East London is a problem because of the communities there, which is flat out wrong. Um, if you look at education, something that uh, people also worry about, uh, you see that it's completely spread. So it's, um, it's already difficult to follow this ki these kind of maps. And that's because a city is a very complex organism. Uh, and I'm only showing you a couple of layers where already people have ideas where they believe they understand when really it is too complex to make sense of in a simple way. Uh, for example, also people believe they have to live in the center to get anywhere. Uh, and if you look at this map um, where what is red is, uh, or, or violet ideally is uh, places that have great mobility, you do have great mobility in the center, but you also have very decent ways to get um, to other places uh, outside that extreme center. And most people, interestingly, in London, I'm not sure how it is in Berlin, um, are simply not aware of that. And they, the problem is they are not aware that they are not aware of it. They believe they know the city and they believe that those things hold absolutely true, uh, but they don't. So what we found out is that everything is connected um, and that a city is really a network of different layers of information and trade-offs. Uh, you might have a place that you like, like this place, uh, this where, where I put the house icon, which is smaller, uh, that is close to people you like and close to a park, but ha doesn't have great transportation. Then there may, might be a place that you really like, but you're worried about the level of crime there, while you like the access to transportation. But it's a trade-off, because you're in the center, you have great transportation, and you have a problem with crime. Uh, and so, in a sense, you face those trade-offs, and most people are not fully aware of why those trade-offs exist and whether there are options that go beyond that. So this is kind of a problem we are looking at, the just amount of data that is required, information that is required to understand even the city you live in. And the question is, how can we make sense of it? Um, and in London especially, we work with a lot of really good open data. Um, and that's thanks to a very strong open data movement in the UK. Uh, that, from my perspective, started with a very early Freedom of Information Act where really people went and said, um, you're a department, I don't have to beg, you are required to give me that information. We have that too in Germany since 2005, but in other respects, 
we are still far behind, as you probably know better, much better than I do. Uh, since 2010, there's an open government license, uh, partly pushed by the Guardian's uh, Free Our Data movement. Um, and basically, it took this idea to the logical conclusion, saying, you know, we don't only have to ask for data, but if it's collected with our money, it should be available to us as well. Um, Germany is, I think, not quite there yet, but we're catching up. I mean, just look around you um, and this conference. Um, I wanted to give an example of what people do in the UK with that data. And again, uh, I think you might have, from what I've seen, heard about this uh, before. Uh, one of the you know, organizations that we really look at as a positive example of what you can do with data is My Society. And My Society is an e-democracy charity that has as its goal to empower people using that uh, available data. And they use open data and they also publish um, as open source the kind of code they are building. So I put the URL there. If you're interested, you can uh, use most of their services, put them on a server and run them, uh, which is just fantastic. Um, they've also been uh, involved in political lobbying um, to make this open data widely available and to keep the process running. Uh, they were involved in uh, getting Inspire uh, on the EU level, which is a, a, a standard for um, open data. Um, and they helped uh, in the uh, in Power of Information Task Force in the UK, which tries to make um, data really in a USP of uh, the UK. So that's great. Uh, one of the examples of uh, what they've been doing is Fix My Street, uh, which is basically a way to uh, to report problems, crowdsource problems that you have in your street where something is damaged, unrepaired, uh, using uh, open data to supplement that. Um, what I think many of you have seen in the last talk is uh, travel time maps where you see how long it will take you uh, to go to a certain place. Um, so these are all based on um, um, really open data, open street map data, and the available transportation data. Uh, but there's really more data available in the UK. Um, for example, if you look at the police, it's a completely different ball game. Um, I've talked to someone here who uh, built the uh, Verbrechens app, which is a, an app showing crime on a, on you know a map uh, for Germany. And the reaction to that from the police, but also from public and media, was, was completely negative um, in many cases, especially from the police. It was uh, experts have to look at this. This data is misleading. It is discriminatory to show certain uh, areas of cities that have problems with crime. So that was, uh, there was not a positive reaction. In the case of the UK, uh, the police has its own site that does exactly that. So the data we're working with in the UK uh, looking at crime for you uh, is uh, you know, every crime at every spot, um, which officers were involved in dealing with it and what the outcomes are. So this data is really available. Um, and it's not only available in a sort of hidden sense, but uh, the UK police runs its own website that has 15,000 unique visitors a day uh, where you can uh, zoom in and find out what your neighborhood looks like and what happened there. Um, there's also noise data, which unfortunately is not completely open. You can access um, some information, but um, uh, we would have to buy it. We haven't yet. So, but this data is at least available uh, in some sort of sense, where they show you the data they use for building permits um, and uh, other official uh, ways of dealing with noise. Um, and as you can see, uh, it's fairly detailed. So there's a lot of data. There's a lot of data that is not only available in the UK, uh, but also across the world. And one of our greatest data sources is really OpenStreetMap, um, which I think many of you, again, will be familiar with. But for us, it's fantastic because having uh, all that Google Maps has and more at our fingertips and being able to go into that, looking at the data and saying, this is the building there. Uh, this is a street, and it's not only a street, but it's a, it's a highway. Um, and having, for example, in our case, the location of um, basically every single tree in London individually uh, to provide some measurement of saying this neighborhood is green, for example, is uh, entirely fantastic. So 
Um, we want to briefly just look at the data sources that we use for, for what we are doing. Um, as I said, first and foremost, there's OpenStreetMap data. Uh, we use market data, uh, really the uh, properties that are available, which of course is not necessarily uh, open source, but uh, uh, we crawl a lot of data and we got a very firm legal opinion that that's fine. Uh, we use transit data, um, but I think you just had a, a good discussion about the problems in Germany. Uh, it's quite freely available in the UK. Um, we use the crime data um, I talked about. Uh, we will use the noise data, um, although there's, again, it's not really open source or open data. And we use demographic data that um, I think is, is far more detailed than anything that you can get um, in Germany at the moment. But some of it you can get, at least for, for Berlin. And we believe there are some substitutes um, that you can do. For example, I talked about the Verbrechens app, which emulates some of the functionality of this crime data. So um, if you ask me if something um, like we do in the UK can be done in, in Berlin, if you can try to understand the city at this point uh, with the open data that is available in Germany, uh, my answer would be, it's a bit harder, but I think it can be done. So you shouldn't limit your thinking, even though um, Germany is a bit behind in this respect. Um, now what we found is the really hard part is making sense of this data, and that's a process we're still in. Um, and I think it's important, and I get back to that, that um, using open data in the sense of just showing you tables doesn't work for most people. So you have to kind of make sense of this data and build models for it. Um, what is safe? We uh, looked at uh, uh, Westminster, which is kind of uh, a party area. And if you take the pure open data, um, the pure crime data that we have, and you map it and you compare it to other parts of the city, it looks like a war zone. Because people get beaten up after going to a club, there's drug use, and so on. But that's not the reality of people's lives. Um, they go there on a weekday, during the day, and it's a safe neighborhood. So people were very confused when we showed them the kind of raw data. Uh, and I think that's, that's a great takeaway, that it has to make sense. It has to be uh, building a model of, of human understanding on top of the data that is available. Just having the data is not enough. Um, and what we also found is that um, Averages don't work. Uh, what is safe for me is maybe not safe for you. So having this human component, uh, going a bit beyond the pure data and personalizing it was extremely important for us. Um, and also, uh, it's, it's very difficult. I showed you the, uh, the city so far, uh, having those judgments. Um, one of, some of them are completely non-linear. So you want to be uh, close to uh, close to street, but you don't want to be too close. Um, so that makes it complicated to uh, to look at those relationships um, in a city. So how do we put it to work in practice? Um, I'm just scratching the surface, but um, still, uh, our first step that we found is that we can use open data to help people understand their needs, because the primary problem is that when people start looking for a place, um, they have some idea, but they don't really know what's out there. They use the kind of heuristics that I touched upon when I talked about the city, often wrong, uh, and they, they don't really know what to expect. So what we are trying to do is uh, use the data that is available, make sense of it, and show people uh, the kind of trade-offs and structures that they're facing, structural problems, really, because a lot of people want to have something like a garden in the center of the city. Or maybe they are not that extreme, but very close to the center. And that's just not happening. And if you tell someone that and you give them the data to work with that, they understand that and they, um, they're okay with that. But what they're currently doing is um, they are using a standard property search and they keep searching, keep getting disappointed until they finally figure it out. And we think uh, by making the tr market more transparent and showing those trade-offs, we can make that process um, more efficient, more transparent, and we can give people a chance to 
not narrowed down to, to a neighborhood. Because what people often do is they end up looking around the place they already know, or they miss a lot of things along the way. And we try to uh, help them shape their needs in a way that works. Um, and then, of course, the next important step is actually helping them uh, find a place. So um, people are overwhelmed by the kind of data that is all already the market data. So just knowing what kind of properties are there, you can't go through all of them. So if there's a standardized process to uh, look through them for you, uh, that is something most people find uh, incredibly helpful. Um, what we need is, is really well, the market data, and what we also need is people's uh, preferences. So what we do is we really ask a quiz. Um, if you have a laptop, you can check it out on homeondemand.co.uk. Um, the URL I showed. So basically, you describe uh, what you're looking for. Um, we save that information. We compare it against uh, what's available on the market. We make sense of it um, using our understanding of the city. And then we give you recommendations. And that's really uh, the core of what we're doing is uh, using that understanding of the city that we have to people's advantage. Um, the kind of infrastructure we're using is uh, luckily uh, in the cloud, which makes my life a little easier. Uh, so we use uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, uh, for scalability. We use uh, Postgres databases. If you're ever doing something with uh, uh, geodata, I, I advise you to, to give uh, Postgres a try because it's, uh, it's really great. And we use Django, uh, which is uh, a front a, 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 a web framework for, for Python, which is a programming language that really allows rapid development. Um, and of course, we use a lot of stuff uh, in the jQuery area for the front end. So I'm just briefly going through that for anyone who is interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you have any questions about how that works, uh, uh, talk to me. But um, the core of it is that uh, if you're working with this much data, you have to start um, thinking about those principles. And I sure had, uh, having no background in that uh, before. Um, and that's, that's important. But I, what I think we figured out is that um, what is even more important than having the data, what's more important than uh, you know, processing the data and having a technical infrastructure and being all happy with that, is to really think of uh, open data from the perspective um, of the consumer because of, or of the user. Consumer is a, is a commercial term and doesn't have to be. In many cases it shouldn't be as my society shows but it has to start from a need. If you think about um, open data and many people and we did um, do uh, is as something that is great because it's there and we have all this data and now we have to do something with it. Um, that's dangerous because uh, maybe people don't want it. So um, I wanted to talk a bit uh, and in a bit more detail since I have a bit more time um, about the consumer side of uh, open data. And I wanted to kind of give a bit of a cautionary tale because we started at the wrong end and we thought about how to make this whole thing as complicated and complex and powerful as possible. And when we started, um, we we built a, a concept where you could kind of enter open text. So you could say, I want to uh, be next to a tube line in the center of the city or uh, have something really safe and green in the outskirts. So you could really just kind of Google-like type in what you want. And it would process this into some kind of structure that said, I want to include these things. Um, and I want to exclude these things. And this is also already a simplified version of what we used. And we were very proud of that because it really used uh, data and the open data that we had to the max. Um, and then people sat in front of it um, and they were like, how does that work? What is this anyway? Can you explain that to me? And we did explain to them and they still didn't get it. Uh, so that was the point at which we started to really look beyond the data angle because um, all this great open data that is available really doesn't help anyone if the interface, the way people interact with it, doesn't work for them. 
And we ended up with uh, something that was much simpler, but it works for almost anyone. And people you know, immediately understand what it's all about. Um, so I think there's a tendency if you, if you deal with data, if you deal with something where, as I showed you, it's pretty obvious that some people ha use pretty simple heuristics, even if they are, for example, in our case, professional estate agents, and you look at your data and you think, okay, we're that much smarter and we understand things that you get wrong and we can help people, um, that you, you start to patronize people and push it on them and say, look, this is your recommendation, this is uh, what we came up with, it's great, use it. Um, and that also is something that I think is not in the spirit of uh, open data and it's also something that um, the movement, if you will, should avoid because uh, what we found when we, uh, when we did our first recommendations was that if we just give a list and attach scores to it and don't explain to people why we came up with that, people react very negatively. It's, uh, it's something that's pushed on them. It's not something that they feel they own. Um, and as complex as all this is, uh, we think there's a, there's a possibility um, to get people to own open data even if they are not nerds like I am. Um, and I think the key to that is understand the weaknesses and the strengths of people because um, what most people are pretty weak at is understanding statistics. So if you just show a bell curve and uh, you uh, try to get people to make sense of that, they won't. It's, uh, it's something that doesn't work for most people. If you um, show an interface that works, um, they, they kind of understand it. So the solution in our case was to repackage data to be kind of understandable and kind of actionable. And since I really have a lot of time at this point, I thought, or I think, I'll just briefly show what the website actually looks like. Um, let's do that. So what we found is um, it matters to get people interested in this. We had a, a beginning, I hope it shows correctly, um, that was very, very data driven and uh, the users we had and the users we tested it with, they really didn't connect with it because it had no emotional value, it was pure data. Um, once we started to turn into something that is fun and that is visible and visual and has uh, a decent design, people started to connect to the data in a completely different way. They started to see the benefit that it would hold for them. Um, you saw kind of our failed project um, where we just had this kind of Windows-like window structure uh, with floating windows and lots of things that people didn't understand. We um, in the end, reverted to something that's very straightforward, which is just a, a questionnaire, if you will, but one that we try to give a, a, a better design. Um, and we are asking those questions, and we're not asking, um, we're not narrowing down, we don't say, um, you know, there are only 50 properties that match your criteria, but we try on an emotional level to get what you really want. Uh, and then make those recommendations and describe what uh, those recommendations are based on. So um, when I do this, uh, you know, what happens here with those, uh, those points uh, has absolutely no effect on your registration, but flat out doubles the amount of information people put in. So it has no function whatsoever, but Gamifying it just a little bit made a huge difference. Um, so people can describe in broad terms where they want to live. We realize very quickly that asking the questions is extremely powerful because we used to give people a kind of throwback to what we had before the opportunity to add as many neighborhoods as they like. And most people really added exactly one exactly like they would in a traditional search on Immobilien Scout or the English equivalents. Um, so we started asking in broader terms what would be kind of acceptable to you and 
people are happy with that. They um, they put in broad areas that they are interested in, and then they put some cherries on top and say, these kind of neighborhoods I would love to live in, if possible. So that already changes completely the way people interact, and it's not a technology problem, it's really an interface problem. Uh, we ask about uh, commuting times um, and what you use to commute. We ask about uh, topics that you care about because not everyone needs school information. If you don't have kids, you don't want that. We personalize it by asking what's walking distance for you and what kind of, excuse me, what kind of places you like to avoid and again, it's different for everyone. We have to figure out what, uh, what dodgy means to you along the way, but we want to get at what's important to you. And then we ask questions about uh, really the property itself, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, what kind of rooms you want, um, and what kind of features you're looking for. Maybe you want a gas stove. Maybe uh, in Berlin case, you want proper double glazed windows. I don't know. But we, we want to know it from you. Um, and then you register in the end, uh, and we can start building a relationship. Um, and what we do is every, every day you will get uh, property recommendations. We're experimenting with this. It's not really done. We, we're a bit inspired by Pinterest because um, we think people don't need to see all those descriptions that say this is an excellent property and an amazing neighborhood, trust me, I'm an agent, but we simply collect here the kind of keywords that match and why. So what's highlighted there is my personal preference. I would like to live in a modern apartment and if at all possible, I'd like a garden, even though I know that's not realistic in London at all. Um, but the system can tell me that. So this is kind of what we came up with after dealing with all those um, kind of data-driven problems. Um, and um, we also realized that no matter how good our algorithm will be in the end, we will not be able to make every recommendation great. So um, if we get to 90%, I'm very happy, but what will happen is automatically you will have some recommendations that are complete crap. And then it's the question, how, how do you deal with that? Do you say, okay, I'm going to hire more developers, so I make the model much more complex, and maybe I you know, gain another percent here and there, and maybe I get it to 95%? Or do you just say, okay, we know there's a problem, we know we will never be perfect, but um, we involve you as the user in this process, and we uh, realize that's peop something people really want. So, um, just throwing back to this kind of question of uh, patronizing or involving the user, uh, where the interface plays a huge role to say, even though we, we own this data, even though we work with this data and uh, we give this data to you, you're still part of the process. And I think that's, um, that's something that was quite important uh, for us to move beyond this where you say, oh, you know, big data, in our case, using a lot of open data, is just something prescriptive. Um, and we want to use this data to build relationships on this, you know, basis of respect to say, first of all, uh, we don't make statistical, um, you know, assumptions about you that are based on averages. Um, we personalize it just because, you know, the average person, uh, likes gardens, you don't have to. You're registered, you tell us what you want. We don't infer everything even though we could. Um, and we get to know you as a person. Um, we show you cause and effect. So if you tell us that recommendation was crap, we need to be able to show nothing like that again to you. Um, and we need to accept that you know better what you want than we do. I, I was at an interesting conference uh, with Telecom, which owns Immobilien Scout uh, last week. Um, and they talked a bit about how they can use data to evaluate their customers and make inferences about their customers. And at some point, I just said, why don't you just ask them? They will answer. Um, so there's limits to, to this kind of data-driven approach. Uh, and there's a ways to make it work in a kind of cooperative setting, which I think is important. Um, and by doing that, instead of just 
telling them something and they walk away happy or unhappy, uh, you can use this data to build relationships. Um, it's very early, um, but I think I'll just open for discussion. I think uh, if you have a question, you have to come up, uh, but um, otherwise I'll come up with something to talk about, really. So, hurry. Hi, and um, thanks a lot for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, very specific question. You said, like, your beta interface at the end looks like the one example on your website where you had the crime statistics still there in detail. Before you said you don't want to give all the data that you have visible. Um, there was something like 20 people beaten up here, uh, three cars damaged, kind of stuff like that. Have you thought about just from the user perspective turn that positive, like very safe environment, etc., etc.? I think that's a great question because if you actually uh, look at the, I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you uh, so you know what, what we've been talking about here. Um, if you look at this, um, you have crime. First of all, it has a gun, which to totally doesn't work for anyone. Um, and it just dumps the data on you. So it just tells you exactly in a, in a 15 minute walking radius um, what went wrong in the last month in your neighborhood. Um, and uh, I can tell you with some certainty, that completely doesn't work for anyone. Uh, we, but that's, that's part of our experiment here. So what we had originally was um, just a kind of marker saying this is above average for this kind of zone, or below average, or this is really dangerous. Uh, people didn't get that either, because it's too much of a simplification to say uh, this is our judgment. Um, and people hated that. So we, for experimental reasons, we went into complete opposite direction and just gave them the exact information that we had um, and they hated that as well uh, because it scares them it's very difficult to compare and it's very difficult to make sense of because currently we don't use any kind of comparison marker here to say what does that actually mean to me um, so uh, what you see is really that's why I'm saying as a technology platform is a we, we try to recently find out how people react to the other extreme, and it's definitely something in between. So uh, I think that's a great question, and that's definitely something where it completely contradicts what I told you uh, before. Um, I mean, what? first of all, uh, I mean, it's part of things that we still need to figure out, but uh, there are ways to uh, combine judgment, human judgment with, with this. So what we uh, tested, but not in this version, is to uh, use uh, statistics for most of the parts and uh, use judgment for others. So most of the um, crime in London is in a fairly uh, reasonable range. So you can say this is more dangerous than that. But there are outliers, like I talked about, West Westminster that have those party areas. And if you uh, say, if you simply attach a label to it saying, yeah, this looks really high, but to, you know, this is the background why it is high, people reacted in our tests fairly positively to that. So I think what really helps is a quick sum up sentence, if you will, even to say, um, this is because it's that, but take it with a grain of salt. It's just weekends. Um, so there's a human factor, I think, that goes beyond just uh, those pure statistics. Uh, do you have a more? Basically stuff like, uh, I'm living in a sort of a crappy area. And uh, if you're new in town, uh, you're pretty high. You have a pretty good chance to get robbed. I know everybody. Everybody kn knows me. Nothing happens. It's perfect. Everybody takes care for each other. So how do you put that into a statistic way of like this is a safe because generally basically it's really a safe area but I was wondering how you put that into sketches like this. Absolutely I mean um, well we uh, I talked very briefly about human judgment and that kind of factor and um, I think what we'll have to do 
And what we've started doing is getting people involved who really know the city on a on a on um, on a personal level, whether personal or or you know in a broader sense. Um, so we we talk, for example, to bloggers about uh, great bike routes in London. Um, because we can we can take those routes from OpenStreetMap. The data is there, but first of all, that's pretty pretty plain, and we don't really have any subjective knowledge of this. So um, what we got is that people who blog are really interested in providing their take on this to put it into context, and um, we can integrate it uh, and give people that context to work with. So I think it's the same for for crime. Uh, you want to move beyond something where you simply crunch the data and you want to put on top of that, uh, if you will, expert judgment and if you can, um, something crowdsourced. Though I have to say from the experience that um, other people have made with crowdsourced neighborhood data, that didn't work so well. So um, there may be ways to do it. This, I have to be honest, um, beyond what we're currently uh, working with, but um, we think there may, may be ways to get people involved uh, directly to, for example, get your expertise in your area, but you have to be sure to give something back. The uh, kind of approaches that we've seen, um, Immobilien Scout has something like that, um, where they kind of just take your judgment, but um, use it commercially without really giving anything back to you, um, didn't work well at all. Uh, so it's something we we hope that if the service that we're building works so fantastically well that you feel that by judging your area, helping others, for example, you improve your own experience as well. This might be something that works, but um, the fallback option would be really to go to people who know those areas, media people, uh, people who write guides, and to integrate their subjective data to put the statistics into context. So um, the question was why I refer to, to crunching data uh, instead of, say, cracking it. And um, that is uh, just a terminology I'm, I'm aware of, uh, but it has no you know, deeper meaning. I mean, what we're doing in practice and what we have to do, what it you know, means in practice is um, not using that kind of raw data like uh, the crime uh, uh, numbers, absolute numbers, but to build a model around it uh, that makes sense of it. And um, for me, that's crunching data, but for other people, it might be model building. Um, so it's just a term. Um. Is there um, a general interest in, in a certain aspect of it that I could go into? bit deeper. I mean, we, I could talk a bit um, uh, deeper about the, uh, uh, the data availability side. I could talk about the um, interface side. Okay, so data. Let's, let's go to straight data. Um, um, I think a comparison is great because um, there's really, if you go to Berlin's data portal, um, daten.berlin. D, I think um, uh, you can see they have a few data sets. But if you go to the UK and if you look what is available there, also beyond the focus of what I presented, because it's part, that's the data we use, um, it's fantastic. So um, what they do is, if you have a local council, uh, and you do, of course, uh, that spends money uh, beyond, I think, 250 pounds, they put that on the internet. So you can look at your local council 
and you can get full lists of what they spend their money on. You can get um, the kind of medication that doctors prescribe in their general practices within the health service of the UK, the NHS. So you have 9,000 data sets on data.gov.uk uh, that you can work with. So um, it is a difference to, to what is available in Germany simply because um, they are required to open this data and they do open that data. It's a matter of, um, of what you're trying to do. Um, my feeling is, looking at that data, is that if you want uh, to do something in the health sector, that's fantastic. If you want to do something like we do with geodata, understanding neighborhoods, understanding you know the urban environment, that's fantastic too because uh, there's a lot of data that I've not been talking about that we don't currently use. Um, they have data on how much of a certain neighborhood is taken up by uh, uh, factories, by uh, concrete, how much of it is uh, lakes and seas. Um, they have pollution. They have amazing demographic data about, um, you know, the kind of uh, people that live around your place, what kind of uh, jobs they have, uh, is it an academic, um, do they work in retail? All this data is at least on the neighborhood level or on a sub-neighborhood level available. Um, and actually one of the discussions I had um, at the telecom conference is that I presented this and I talked about how great uh, it is to have this data. Um, and someone working quite high up in telecom turned to me and uh, said, yeah, but is it really that great? Because I have fear for my privacy. So I think, I mean, this might not be a forum where we disagree much, but I think uh, when Germany still exists and uh, I don't want to dismiss it out of hand, if you look at the kind of situation that Google, Google Maps is facing, is that yes, this much data is available, but the question is, um, culturally, uh, do people feel that's, that's appropriate? Is that something that people feel comfortable with? I talked about how we are moving in this direction uh, where we might approach data.gov.uk, but uh, I'm still not entirely sure if that's something that can work in Germany. Like, do the doctors really want to show what they are prescribing? Is that something that will fly here? Um, and I, I, I know, show of hands, who thinks that there's something as too much open data? Yeah, I figured, okay. So, um, maybe uh, just giving briefly my assessment of, of the direction that we're going in, because uh, as you've seen, I've, I'm quite interested in, in the political sphere as well. Um, my understanding is that in many ways um, the open data process in the UK was driven by media but also by companies. I mean the reason they are, the governments are doing this now in the UK is um, not only because they think it's a great issue and because they are, feel passionate about open data uh, but because many people, many companies come to them and uh, say it's a, you know, it's a competitive advantage to have this data and to work with it. Um, and if you ask me why I think this will happen in Germany as well and why we're in this process, um, I think it's less because there's a philosophical underpinning where people feel extremely comfortable with the idea of getting this data out there. The departments uh, will always uh, fight this. In fact, the uh, department in the UK that has all this geodata that we are using um, they got a first-class lawyer to shut it down, this whole open data movement in the UK. So it's not like it went all seamlessly. There was a lot of fight back and there will be a lot of fight back here. Uh, but I think what drives the process in the end is really, uh, you know, the desire to have a competitive advantage. And if it shows in the UK and we're part of that, that it is a competitive advantage to have access to this data, it will happen here out of necessity um, and not out of uh, uh, goodwill. And I think it would be right for the open data movement to uh, look at this aspect and not only lobby in the sense of uh, it's the democratic way to do it, but also to just practically go out there 
and say, if you want to have growth in technology, this is what needs to be done. Um, and hopefully, as half German startup, we can be part of it in that sense um, that uh, we give back um, in many ways, but in this way as well of saying, uh, this is something that you can make money with, uh, and this is why it's a good idea. Is there interest in the technology side? I only touched that very briefly. Um, or is there, you, I think you had, do you have maybe specific questions about the data that is available in the UK? Okay. I was interested in how many other organizations than the police uh, taking, putting effort in uh, transferring Excel data into maps. Well, uh, the question about maps, um, there are a lot of efforts, um, especially from startups, um, to put stuff on maps. I mean, this is especially true for, for the real estate sector. Where um, I mean, we are fairly non-map based, uh, but there are a lot of uh, real estate startups that start with a map exclusively. Uh, the only government department that I'm aware of that uses like a completely map-centric approach, like the police.uk website, is in fact you know the police itself. Um, it might make less sense for the NHS, apart from finding your um, local doctor, to put this information on a in a very geo-focused way. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the map vision is more part of, uh, of the private sector in the UK that at least I'm aware of than uh, public. So, um, but you should check out the police um, website because it's a fantastic uh, way of uh, evaluating neighborhoods and it's a fantastic um, example for the police here. I mean, that's what they should do. Um, and there's, uh, uh, there are German versions that do it in a similar way. Um, I think in a, in a more general sense, when it comes to maps, we started off, uh, in fact, with something that was a big map with, um, you know, kind of showing all the data that we had on this map. Um, and that's very fancy, and lots of people get a p good positive reaction on the first uh, the first time they look at it, but um, what we found is that people have extreme differences, uh, difficulties looking at small differences in color if you map in a kind of heat map fashion on such a map. So um, that's why we kind of turned away from that, and uh, I suspect that's why uh, many other data providers in the UK, for example, the NHS, um, don't use a map-based approach because some data really doesn't fit there so well, um, especially when it gets complicated. I mean, I um, I showed you this, um, and I was hoping uh, that you would get a bit confused uh, because that makes the point. Um, let me get there. This is even worse, but. Um, when I would tell you to tell me what the uh, neighborhoods with best education are, and those are the darker ones here, um, it just gets very difficult to figure out. S spread across the town, there are certain clusters, but um, what we realized when we did exactly this kind of thing with our data is that um, it doesn't work. Certain stuff doesn't work, which, I mean, it's basically the interface question, right? Um, just having this kind of data is good. Putting it on such a map in terms of education 
is also good. But if you can ask people, how old are your kids? Uh, what kind of schools are you looking for? Uh, what kind of subjects matter to you? And then you give them a, a detailed output. Um, that is something we found in this space, people found uh, more useful. Um, so, okay. Uh, I, I take it there are um, no other questions. I, um, I'll bang on just two more minutes um, about the interface thing because that was really our takeaway and it's such a conference that is really focusing on data. Um, I just wanted to drive this point home because it was so important to us. People didn't even get to the things that we found important because uh, they were completely turned off by, by the interface. So, I mean, what you want to do is, is have interactivity. You want to, if you want to show a map, you should show a map where people can click on things, where people can interact with these things, and where people can see a result of their interest, uh, narrowing down the data, working with the data. I think in the police.uk's website, which is generally uh, fantastic, um, has more to do there. So if you go out there and you want to do something uh, with open data, be it commercial, be it uh, 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 non-commercial, for pure benefit of the public. Um, get someone who understands data, get someone who understands databases, but also think about getting a designer and getting someone who knows the user experience. And um, because in the end, that was it comes down to. Um, the interest of people is there. Uh, we looked when we started at the number of people who use uh, kind of statistics portals that exist in the UK. Many of them use five at a time. They compare, but they can't make sense of it. And that's why we integrated it. So it's um, enjoy open data, cherish open data, make it work, but make sure to make it work for the user. And that's, uh, I think, well, I'll end up. Thank you. <laughs>